seminar series uh, on proposals for electing the chief executive in 2017, organized by the Faculty of Law Center for Comparative and Public Law. And Cora Chan will be uh, the moderator of this seminar series. Uh, today, we are very honored to have invited Professor Simon Young and Professor Michael Davis, both from the Faculty of Law, to speak for us. The aim of this seminar series is to provide a platform for members of the public uh, who have suggested proposals on what the electoral model for the Chief Executive in 2017 should look like to explain their proposals to the public. So the whole event is going to be uh, uh, recorded um, and um, clips of it will be uploaded onto the web uh, later on for public education purposes. Uh, the rundown of the event will be uh, each of the speakers will have about 10 minutes to present their proposal, uh, followed by um, a five minute session with our student commentators. Uh, then we'll have about 20 minutes of free discussion among um, our guests, and finally, uh, about 20 minutes of um, Q&A from the floor. Uh, so, uh, any questions before we begin? If not, uh, then uh, without further ado, may we invite Professor Simon Young to present his proposal. Thanks very much, Cora, and thanks to Guja and also CCPL. Um, as all of you know, the, uh, every reform proposal has to have three parts. Uh, it has to have a nomination method. It has to say something about the nominating committee. Uh, and it also has to have uh, proposals about how territory-wide election of the chief executive would be conducted. So I'll, I'll address all three of those parts in my proposal. Um, but what I'd like to say first is uh, just to give clear statement of the thinking behind uh, this proposal. Uh, one is that it tries to stick to uh, and be faithful to Article 45, in that uh, the power to nominate is going to be exclusively a committee. Uh, but at the same time, uh, this is a proposal that also uh, tries to give the public uh, some role to play in nominations. Um, and uh, I've in saying, I know we've been using this term uh, civic no uh, recommendation as opposed to civic nomination. Um, so my proposal doesn't necessarily have civic nomination in that the power of the people to nominate. Uh, nor does it really have civic recommendation because that term sounds a bit soft as if you're just recommending people to uh, the committee. Uh, instead, um, I'm sorry this is only in Chinese, and I have to thank the people at Ming uh, for, uh, for preparing this, uh, for, for the story that went through the, uh, the story. Um, and uh, I'll just sort of explain uh, uh, this sort of two-step, two-stage approach to nomination uh, that I've adopted in my uh, proposal. The first stage is what I call uh, the standing stage. You have to have standing to be nominated. And to get standing, there's one of two ways. Uh, track, track A uh, means you get uh, one-eighth uh, uh, nominations. Uh, these are paper nominations in the usual way uh, uh, for getting standing to be nominated. And then uh, track B is the more civic method where uh, you get 5,000 signatures. So uh, the thinking is that either you uh, have support from the committee itself, or you have support from the public in order to have standing. And then the second stage is where the nomination actually takes place. And here, I'm trying to be faithful to the language of Article 45, where it talks about uh, nomination by democratic procedures. That typically implies some kind of voting is done uh, within the nominating committee. And so, uh, what I've come up with is that there has to be two tracks for voting. And I'll, I'll explain to you why it's not practical or good to have only one track for voting uh, in a moment. But with two tracks respecting the two different ways of becoming a candidate, um, if you're going by reference to support of the committee for standing, then you've got to win an election, or at least you have got to have at least uh, 
be, be amongst the top three candidates uh, in terms of getting the number of votes. Um, and so up to three uh, would be nominated under this method. Uh, under track B, uh, this is what I would say uh, is an easier way of getting nominated because you've really got public support. And, and by that way, one simply has to cross the threshold. And in fact, it's the one-eighth threshold, the same threshold that we've all be, always been using for nominations. Uh, but here's the catch is that you, you have to do it in the form of a vote. Um, and so uh, uh, you know, that's, uh, in fact, that in, in a way mirrors the way we elect uh, the chief executive uh, up until 2012. And then after the nomination uh, uh, process, then we come to the, the election. This isn't too controversial. Um, and this is the so-called uh, 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 election where uh, we have to, the candidate would have to get about 50 more than 50 percent of the support of the public in order to be returned as the chief executive. Um, and if there's only one candidate, so we still have to have election. Uh, I, I, I put in this sort of cushion area between 40 and 50 percent, you know, just so that it's not too disruptive, uh, so that if it's if one can get 40-50%, one just has another vote with it without having to do the whole process again. If there's only two candidates, and I suggest that we just have a straight vote, and whoever gets the most votes uh, should win. And then with uh, more than three candidates, then it's important that the person who wins not only has the most votes, but also has at least 50% of the support of the public. And I recommend that we do that by uh, way of two uh, uh, votes two elections if necessary. Uh, so the first election, if no one gets more than 50%, uh, then uh, only then we go to the second election where only the top two candidates compete. Um, so now, finally, uh, I want to say something about the um, nomination uh, committee um, and, and the issue of representatives, because I think this is uh, quite an important issue. Actually, one more thing before, before I go there, because I want to actually il illustrate how this nomination method would work uh, with reference to the old uh, 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 or the previous two uh, competitive elections that we had with the chief executive. So uh, let's think back to 2007. Okay. Uh, this is uh, what happened. Recall two candidates. Uh, and recall uh, they both were able to get nominated because they were able to get one-eighth, more than 12.5 percent. But then when they had the election, um, obviously uh, Donald Trump had got the most votes, uh, but uh, Alan Lerner was able to get 15.38 percent of the vote. And so under my system, uh, both these candidates uh, would have been nominated because both are able, so for example, track A, they're able to get the 12.5 in order to have standing, right? And then when the election is done for the candidates, um, both are able to, you know, get you know, more than 12.5, and uh, and there, you know, well, there's only two, so uh, both will be returned as long as you pass the 12.5. Same for Track B uh, as well. You're both able to pass the threshold. Now, interesting is uh, the results uh, for the 2012 election. So this time, remember, firstly, all the candidates were able to get 12.5%, one-eighth, in order to be nominated. Right? Then, of course, when the actual election was done, right, um, you know, voters can vote however they like. They don't have to stick to their nomination. Right? Um, and it's a blind, it's a blind, it's a secret ballot. So you see, you know, Albert Ho, you know, he lost some of his supporters. They, they obviously went to the other candidates. So this is some of the risk that you have when you just have a single election uh, for, for purposes of nomination. Um, so on, on the face of it, you may think, well, under my proposal, since Albert Ho doesn't get that threshold of 12 to 5, he wouldn't be nominated under my proposal. Well, I say, wait a second, right? this is a dual track. Proposal. And under the dual track proposal, I would think that someone like Albert Ho has popular support, right? he would come under track B. Right? And the fact that he was able to get 12.5% uh, 
percent nominations, it strongly suggests that we'll also be able to get that 12.5 percent in terms of the, not the threshold vote, and then we've nominated. And the people like uh, C.Y. Lerner and Henry Tang, uh, they would come most likely under track A because they would feel that they had uh, stronger support from the committee members, uh, and they could uh, uh, be uh, nominated under track A. Right. So. I think that with this uh, proposal, there's enough flexibility there that someone with popular support could still be uh, nominated under Track B. Because the 5,000 threshold, although it's quite significant, it's, I mean, it's not uh, impractical uh, to achieve. Uh, and so finally, I turn to the issue of what, what to do about the nominating committee, because that's a crucial issue. And I don't have any specific proposals here. The reason, by, reason, reason being, is that um, I think there are a lot of good ideas that have been floated. Uh, you know, expansion of the size, having a directly elected element, getting rid of corporate voting. I think there are many things that we can do to get rid of, uh, or to, sorry, to make it more representative uh, than the existing election committee. Um, but here's the, here's the problem, is that I feel that if we leave, it, it's sort of more of a procedural recommendation that I'm making. We leave this problem with the task force itself. What I fear, looking at what has happened before with other previous reform consultations, is that the government will say, well, there are too many different ideas on how to move forward. So there's no real consensus. Uh, so it's too difficult to change the existing system. But we might be able to add uh, more members that have more sort of public representation to it, uh, but we won't do anything with the existing system. Right? And we saw that, of course, in, in 2012 with Legco. It didn't change the function of constituencies at all. It was too, too difficult. It didn't abolish corporate voting. All they did was add five more seats uh, representing the so-called super, being the super seats. Right? I, I fear that that could well happen here as well. So I want to recommend something that uh, would get us uh, beyond that, where we are uh, moving towards a more independent process that has greater expertise uh, and has a specific goal of looking at uh, how the whole system can be changed in a holistic and coherent way. And I think the job for that should be with some independent committee, uh, possibly led by a judge or former judge. In fact, it would be a lot like a law reform exercise where you're looking at all the different proposals. And, and this such a committee wouldn't just start from scratch. They would have the, you know, the more than 10,000 submissions that people have made already. And of course, government will process that and we'll get to the report probably in the summer sometime. But I think the committee, over a longer period of time, say six months, could do a lot more work with that. And they could also study how the election committee has also worked in the past. So I, this is an idea that I hope that people would give some serious consideration to. Um, right. So I think that, that completes uh, my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Young. Uh, we know we'd like to see your hands to raise some questions. So uh, thank you for your presentation, Professor Young. Um, um, I'm Matthew Choi. I uh, government law uh, the ESC. So when I first uh, uh, look at your uh, look at your proposal, I think it's uh, uh, quite similar to the proposal by a number of uh, academics last week, especially in terms of your track E uh, nomination. Um, so uh, my question is that uh, because from the 2012 C election, we 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 see that the the way by which the candidates get nomination is very separate. And, and we think that it's, it's not transparent, and uh, uh, some have speculated that there is some kind of exchange of interest in that closed door process. And, and also, uh, I think even in your proposal, uh, the uh, uh, civic nomination can at most be a kind of political pressure uh, for the uh, members of the nominating committee to uh, nominate a particular candidate that is supported by the public. Um, so another proposal that is uh, other than your proposal is that instead of endorsing which candidate uh, to enter the election, uh, the members of the nominating committee uh, should be provided with a clear
clearly defined set of rules uh, as to not to endorse certain kind of uh, uh, a certain candidates rather than endorsing. So, uh, how would you compare this kind of uh, uh, proposal with your proposal as you track me? Well, I'm not familiar with uh, those other kinds of proposals that you've talked about. Um, I think the minute that you sort of mentioned rules right, and criteria, uh, and to expect that a committee could operate on the basis of such criteria, uh, I just don't think that's workable. Um, I mean, I think the idea is that the basic law says democratic procedures. Um, and I think also that um, you know, if you look at how the previous election committee had worked, uh, you know, it's in the spirit of of a democratic process where you do, where your interests are important uh, and you will need to identify those who support you uh, in that committee and, and hence that's why we have, for example, in the legal sector, uh, you know, coming out very clearly saying that this is who they're supporting and, and hence they're able to get their support. So I think it's that kind of um, uh, 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 political process really uh, that you just can't escape. Uh, in that, I mean, members of the committee will be able to come up with their own sort of rules and policies and, and you know, their own uh, political perspectives. And that's really part of the political process. Um, so, I'm not sure if uh, in what you're suggesting as, as the alternative is viable. Um, I think just to illustrate uh, that opponent proposal is that uh, the members of the nominating committee uh, give a number of uh, uh, very clearly defined uh, uh, criteria that, uh, 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 for example, like, uh, uh, involve uh, the past criminal records and, and, and so to disqualify some kind of uh, uh, some other candidates from the election. But uh, I have a, a second question is, is, uh, about the uh, uh, election uh, reform committee. Yeah. And, uh, uh, my question is that um, do you think we should uh, trust the uh, members of the public? Uh, do, do you think we should uh, trust judges uh, uh, or that uh, retired judges that, uh, 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 Because uh, I think this is uh, very different from law reforms you have just suggested. This is ultimately a, a political question. Um, the reason why I suggest that a judge uh, should look at it because uh, at the end of the day, Details are very, very important. I mean, this is one of my sort of uh, uh, concerns about some of the proposals that have come out recently. Is that they're, not, they're very weak on details um, as to how the nomination is actually going to work. And I think uh, at the end of the day, one has to be able to translate these proposals into law. Uh, and that's why uh, a judge or someone, you know, uh, very uh, uh, you know learned in the law uh, would be most effective. So they're not just making these general proposals, but we'll be able to actually put it into some concrete recommendations that can easily translate it into legislation. Um, and, and in fact, I, I sort of come at this from my experience with the Hong Kong Law Reform Commission, you know, where there have been subcommittees that have been chaired by judges, and, and, they, and the proposals that have come out have been very effective. Um, and I think also uh, there's the issue of authority. Um, I mean, we don't know exactly what's going to happen when the government's report comes out. Uh, but there could well be challenges of, to the authority. What's, what's coming out? Is it authoritative? Is it, is it transparent? Right. I mean, we're, we're leaving, we're trusting government to do this on their own, you know, behind closed doors, to take over 10,000 submissions from the public and to process it, to come up with something that's intelligible right, in terms of the report. And we're trusting them to do that in an effective way. Um, we, we saw how they did it with Article 23. I know it's a different administration. But that kind of process can be very risky and dangerous. I say we give it to an independent committee that operates in a more transparent manner, give them more time to work on it as well, six months, uh, and to come back with recommendations. So an example of that would be what happened recently after the ICAC former chief executive fiasco, and then we had the former chief justice uh, and a very small committee come together and concrete recommendations. Sadly, we're still waiting for the implementation of those recommendations, but it's that kind of process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Professor Young and Dr. Matthew. Um, may we now invite Professor Davis to present his proposal. Election 
uh, by sectors and subsectors should be roughly equal because recall the ICCPR says equal voting. It doesn't say just that everyone gets to vote, but that their votes should be relatively equal. There's a lot of experience with that in the world, the gerrymandering we call it. So perfect equality is rarely achieved, but relatively e equality should be important because you have to bear in mind the nominating committee itself is an official body. So you're actually rep electing the officials when you elect the nominating committee. So it seems to me important that our votes be equal uh, in that regard and that certain groups not be excluded. I also follow the existing election committee nomination of one-eighth of nominating committee members. Again, trying to as much as possible comply. You see the Article 44 requirements there. And one nominating committee member has one vote. That's exactly true also under the existing election committee. And I am prompt judicial review of alleged irregularities. I think that's important. A lot of countries in the world use the judiciary. Sometimes they set up independent bodies to, uh, to oversight elections. But often judiciary performs the role. And there's often an expedited method for doing that. Uh, when it comes to what I call public recommendations, I require 10,000 signatures. And I think this warrants a nominating committee having a good faith consideration of that person. I don't have two steps, but again, I'm committed to simplicity. I want it uh, as simple as possible and as understandable as possible. Uh, again, I also have two rounds. If, if you, in the first round, by having a 1A threshold, you can have as much as eight candidates, uh, or you could have less, depending on who did what in the nominating process. And so if the second round were needed, and by the way, I would say that the public recommendation, I think all candidates who qualify for the nominating committee have to be subject to the nominating committee's vote. There's no idea that some people would be somehow, before they file their papers for nomination, and they would be ignored. Uh, every candidate has to be voted up and down in whatever procedure is deemed appropriate for the nominating process. So it's not uh, the fact that you've got uh, signatures from the public, uh, it, that also applies to you as well. What I've suggested is a good faith requirement of support. But again, I'm trying to get around Beijing's uh, limitation that the civil nomination would not be required. Okay? So that's why I do that. And then finally, I say the person should be appointed loyal to, do they love Hong Kong, love China, but they have to swear a statutory oath. To me, that's how that's done all over the world. So it shouldn't be more complicated than that. Uh, with this in mind, because my proposal is a litmus test proposal, I, in case media are here, I've suggested 10 questions you can ask about any proposal. And you can see them here. I have to go over them really quickly because of the time limitations. Our nominating committee, committee members elected by the broadest base of Hong Kong voters. What specific actions are proposed to ensure the official nominating committee is broadly represented, including the numbers of voters? Are certain classes of voters excluded from voting for members of the nominating committee, such as workers, sole proprietors, minorities, homemakers, and so on? Are the sizes of the constituency sectors created to elect members of the nominating committee designed to ensure equal voting rights? Will the public at large be consulted and allowed a reasonable avenue to provide early public input into the nominating process? Are any candidates to be excluded from nomination the Though either, oh, I, sh I should be an there, through either direct or indirect discrimination based on status or political opinion? Is the threshold for nomination by the single nominating committee sufficiently low to enable nominees of opposing viewpoints to be nominated? That's the thing you've got to bear in mind. We're not doing party nominations, we're doing a single body official nominating committee. If you don't have a low threshold, then you're going to exclude people of different opinions. So even satisfying the basic ICCPR requirements, I think, requires a low threshold as a matter of law. Otherwise, you won't be able to nominate except some, you know, uh, very popular uh, <coughs> nominating committee members. You, in this case, with an official body, I think there's a legal requirement to give free choice to the voters. And the only way that's achievable in a single nominating body is to have a low threshold. So this is very important. Will the voters based on universal and equal suffrage be allowed a free choice of nominees to fully reflect the voters' will? That's required by the ICCPR. Will the overall nominating process be reasonable, fair, and open? Will the final winner be required to have at least 50% of the vote? 
So I think these are questions that reporters should be asking. Uh, they should publish it as a list and send it out to all government officials as to what they're doing because this is what I think human rights under the ICCPR and the basic law require. Looking quickly at some things on the table, directly elect the nominating committee, to me that's the best option, frankly. Okay? I'm, my, my litmus test proposal is trying to ask whether Beijing's ideas can pass the test under human rights. But directly electing the nominating committee to me is without question the best proposal. And it can be done by having directly elected legislators and district council members. This option clearly passes the LT, the litmus test. Okay? Another option that Johannes and others were talking about recently, legislative council of the nominating committee. Okay? Uh, actually, that doesn't pass the litmus test because it doesn't provide equal voting for all members of the nominating committee. But let's face it, we're going to probably have to do a deal at the end of the day. And this is eminently better than what most of the establishment camp has come up with in terms of guaranteeing the basic free choice of the voters, a basic human rights requirement. Okay? Use of civil nominations. This clearly is supported by the ICCPR. It's used around the world. It's a very legitimate way. If it's binding on the nominating committee, then we know Beijing's going to complain that the nominating committee doesn't have a real choice. But if it's recommendatory to the nominating committee, then it easily passes the basic law and the ICCPR test. Block voting fails. Block voting violates both the basic law and the ICCPR. Uh, bear in mind that every time you violate the ICCPR, you also violate the basic law because basic law requires the ICCPR. And so if you set the threshold so high, as I said a few moments ago, you don't give the voters a free choice. Okay? Simon's proposal, I think it passes the litmus test if he achieves one thing, and that is an adequate nominating committee. He hasn't told us about that, but he has a process to get there. If his nominating committee satisfies the test that I gave earlier, the litmus test and the basic law and ICCPR requirements, then his proposal could pass. If somehow the nominating committee is a compromise, it may not pass the litmus test. Now, maybe at the end of the day, all we really want out of this is the Democrats to be elected. I was in the Article 45 concern group, and I know early on, the entire Democratic camp was very pessimistic about Beijing's intentions and just took the view that, well, if we can get any nominating committee, it could be the Humane Society as the nominating committee. As long as we can get a Democrat through, then we're okay. That may be where we wind up. Christopher Forsyth said something like that recently. But right now, I don't think that's where we want to go. But in any case, I think Simon's thing passes. What I think about Simon's proposal is that you would not want to support any candidate who would not go out and get 5,000 signatures because you'd think he was an idiot, right? I mean, why would anybody go through the second hurdle and jump through all these hoops if all they needed was 5,000 signatures? There's nobody who could possibly be a decent candidate who's not capable of getting 5,000 signatures because that's fairly low threshold. So if that's true, then really it comes down to, again, anybody with 5,000 signatures needs one eight threshold. And so I, I think in some ways, Simons is very similar to the 18 academics. The 18 academics is very similar to mine. Bear in mind that I published mine a couple weeks before theirs. Okay? Uh, in fact, they wanted me to join in their proposal. And the only reason I didn't is two reasons. One is I had just put out my own proposal, so I looked I'm kind of stupid to then the next day embrace another proposal that's very similar. And the second reason I didn't enjoy their proposal, I think the 70,000 signatures is way, way too high. That this is, to me, this is a, a huge obstacle to public participation. And so I have a strong objection to the 70,000 signature requirement. But otherwise, Simon's and theirs and mine largely, I think, pass the litmus test if the nominating committee can be fixed, okay, and it's not uh, somehow uh, failing the test. I think Albert Chun's proposal fails the litmus test, okay. I think it fails because it's not compliant with the, in regard to election of the nominating committee, because he already tells us the nominating committee won't be so, so broadly representative and involve equal voting and so on for these official representatives, okay. And second stage of his nominating committee uh, block voting is used 
and, and I think block voting would deny the voters free choice. And finally, the central government can uh, veto any choice, and I think that also violates the voters' rights. So I think Alberts uh, fails in that regard. Uh, Ronnie Tong has actually come out also supporting my litmus test at various times when we would share the stage. Uh, and his proposal, again, really is fine as long as the nominating committee can be fixed. So that's my overall thing, and I can entertain questions on Thank you very much, Professor Davis.
So I think the fourth sector, I'm a, I'm a little more flexible, uh, you know, in regard to its makeup. But I would like to see the first three sectors be roughly equal. Now, of course, if everyone says, well, that's so many voters, and they're all going to be involved in the nominating committee, or they're going to want to vote, or they're going to pay attention to all kinds of issues. Uh, one answer would be, well, why don't we directly elect it? Bear in mind, why are we doing all this complicated stuff about following the election committee and so on? I assume Beijing wants to use it to exclude people who are running for office. If they can see that the process shouldn't exclude people, then maybe they should just realize, why don't we just open the process up and stop uh, this game of using the election committee as a reference and so on. I assume that was all designed to contain and constrain who could be nominated. If the public somehow convinces the Beijing government and the Hong Kong government that we don't really want to do that, we don't want to have a sham election, then maybe the next step would be to actually just look at a simpler form, as Johannes Chan has suggested a couple already, where you just directly elect the members of the nominating committee and keep it small. But that's all off the table because of Beijing's constraints at the moment. Maybe they will stick with that. They'll lose too much face, even if they accept that some Democrats can be nominated. And that's by no means certain. But if they accept that, then maybe they still will insist on this election committee reference. I don't know. But uh, I think it's doable. I think a smart bunch of people can sit down in a working group and come up with a, a proposal that's eminently fair and gives and doesn't exclude people from this choice of the nominating committee, this official body. Thank you very much, Professor Davis. Uh, uh, thank you, Lydia. Do you have a second question? Uh, uh, okay. Could I keep that to the full session? If okay. you do not have this. Well, we, we have about um, 15 to 20 minutes for your discussion. Do you have a question? Just one supplement. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, please. I just want to quickly supplement something that Michael will talk about in terms of equality. Uh, in our book on the uh, election of the chief executive, we have this appendix, Appendix 21, uh, where we try to imagine what the uh, election committee would look like if it stuck to the principle of equality uh, in looking at how you allocate the number of seats based on the size. Right? Because if your sector is large, you should get more representatives. Right? That completely is violated right now with the election committee. And I'll just give you an example. If you, if you follow that idea of equality, the agricultural and fisheries subsector in sector three should only get two members, right? because their size is only 1% of the, you know, the total number of, of members, instead of the 40 uh, uh, that they get under that system at that time. Yeah, so this is, this is to me what the goal ought to be to achieve Test. Thank, you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Davis and Professor Young. Thank you, Lydia and Matthew. So, uh, about 15 to 20 minutes pre discussion time between you two. Uh, if you guys have other things to say, we can always open up the session to the floor earlier. Yeah, I think we agree with so much, we can fuss over a little tidbits, but otherwise, I would open it to the floor. One question for uh, <laughs> so kindly commented on my proposal. <laughs> You're recommending a single vote, uh, and if you get the threshold of uh, one eighth, then you're in. And what, what happened uh, in 2012 when they had that single vote? That means like someone like Albert Ho would not, not get it because he didn't get the, the one eighth. Well, of course, if we have that horrible nominating committee that is just exactly like the election committee. It will be a challenge. I remember when we were running uh, colleagues in the education sector and elsewhere to try to make sure you could get one Democrat nominated for the selection committee. It wasn't easy. So uh, this existing election committee, I think, is, is so grossly in violation of both the basic law and the ICCPR in terms of being broadly representative that uh, I, I hate to say it, but then Benny will become speaker. Let's just go to the street because I think all people would reject uh, that. So that, that constraint may be less important when, uh, when you have a more representative, even if not fully representative, nominating committee. Uh, then I, and then I think we can leave it to the 
the government and the legislature to come up with some mechanics on, on how to conduct the vote. It could be either by signature, where you nominate and you're done, uh, which event I would vote even that event had enough to get nominated. Uh, and once that nomination, that threshold is reached, then you wouldn't have to do a separate vote. But if, if that separate vote is required, you could decide, you would have to decide whether someone who nominated was bound by the earlier vote or not. But again, if the nominating committee is not so completely unrepresentative, then I think the problem would be more uh, diminished. Well, this is why I say the, the details matter. I mean, I think it makes a big difference whether you're getting paper nominations, whether you're getting sort of a system where you can put a single candidate before the committee and you say vote and see if that person passes a threshold, or whether you put multiple candidates before the committee and then say vote. But that can really affect uh, the outcome. Uh, so those kinds of details matter. Whereas, you know, where I'm proposing the two track, um, you don't, I mean, you're placing your, all your eggs sort of on, uh, in the basket of nominating committee. You're saying it has to be a good nominating committee. Whereas with the two tracks, Perhaps the nominee may not be uh, perfect, but at least there'll be a, a, you know, more of a flexible system to allow for more voter choice. Yeah, but I think that just makes things more complicated. In fact, when I, 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 when I finally figured out your proposal, I liked it, but it took me a while to figure out what your proposal was. In fact, the bullet points you had at the beginning to simplify it made it more complicated. You could have taken them out. I told you that before you put it out. <laughs> and so I think that that's a problem for the public. But I think at the end of the day, what happened in that case was built on the rules. So people, maybe, enlightened people, had a view that we shouldn't be able to nominate someone from the Democratic camp, even if they personally didn't plan to vote for them in the election itself. But they may have had that view, okay? So they would do it. If the rules said, whatever you nominate, you know, you own it, it's yours, then people would behave in accordance with that rule. So I think that's fine. You know, I don't I don't think I don't think this is a problem to have this two stages. And I think it is a problem if what we do is too complicated and hard for the public to understand. This was actually my concern with Ronnie's proposal, Ronnie Tom's proposal, and the way he doesn't have two stage election. I actually like a two stage election that you have two rounds. There's a reason for that. Uh, if you only have one round and then you do some math and get the second choice and so on, I think that's very confusing first to the public, but also when you have two rounds, there's another thing accomplished. Say myself, uh, not myself because I'm not a permanent resident of Hong Kong, but Benny and, and, and Simon Run, and they're both, uh, you know, uh, nominated and they go to an election but nobody wins in the first round. Uh, but Benny, as he's one of the top two vote getters, he can then approach Simon to get his votes, you know, to get his support. And I think for the final winner, that would be an advantage to have mobilized behind him all of the candidates who had to drop out because they, they weren't the top two vote getters in the first round. So to me, having a second round serves the purpose of bringing unity to a political camp. Uh, and so that in the second round, then this candidate will, will be able to uh, bring on board in his team people that may have been opposing him in the first round. So I think that's why I like two rounds. I suspect Simon has the same reason. It's this obvious reason for having two rounds in that regard. The only thing I don't get is Simon's 5,000. So since we're supposed to talk to each other, uh, seems to me that any serious candidate, is my point, would go for the 5,000 because if you're serious, I mean, hard to imagine somebody who's so lacking in political skills and public mobilization capability, they can't get 5,000 signatures somewhere from their sector of the electorate. Uh, and it would be hard to imagine the voters would take it seriously. And so because you create a kind of block voting model that would be harder to clear, uh, it would seem to me that everybody that's worthy of thought consideration would get the 5,000 signatures. So why have all this complexity uh, about some alternative round? Well, it's, just, it's really just sort of, the, the, I think a lot of it's just practicality. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the basic law contemplates it's a, a non-named committee that has the power. And so I don't think, you know, having that other track B 
the mechanism somehow undermines the nominating committee. People will still naturally go to the nominating committee for their support. Uh, and that's why, you know, where I think that's what we call more mainstream people would go there without necessarily having uh, uh, public support. I'm just, I, 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 I was guessing why you did it was because uh, China is saying that it wants a block vote, and so you created a mechanism. I, Martin Lee was, we were having lunch one day, and he suggested another mechanism for a block vote, and that is that the nominating committee with a 1A threshold could come up with up to eight nominees, and then all eight of them as a unit would be submitted to the whole committee for a block vote up or down. And so then you would have a block vote too. I mean, that's another method of creating. Uh, I guess what we're doing, if we do something like this, is we're trying to respond to Beijing's requirement that, well, this democratic procedure includes a, requires a block vote of some sort. But uh, it does seem kind of far-fetched. And, and as I said earlier, I think because you have a, one official nominating committee, it's just not democratic unless the threshold is low. And so the nominating committee is doing something. I'm not, in, in the litmus test proposal, I'm not saying that a civil nomination would be binding on the nominating committee, so it does get a chance to respond. But I think the money threshold, which is what applied previously to the nominating the election committee, seems to be eminently practical and engages the nominating committee. So I, I don't really want to embrace the block voting when it seems silly, like up and down for all eight candidates or something. I think at some point you just stretch. Uh, credibility to the breaking point. Yeah. Um, perhaps we can open the session to the floor. But you agree. Um, any any questions? Yes, yeah, please. Uh, hi, Professor Davis. Uh, I'm a law student here and student researcher at CCPL. Um, I have a question for you. Is do you think that your recommendation on the number of signature? Uh, or for the public recognition will vary depending on the ultimate mechanism on the composition of nominating committee, whether it's directly elected or how this sector is uh, distributed. Yeah, I'm, I, I have to say all the math in my proposal, that's the one that I'm a little flexible on. I'm not happy with 70,000 signatures because I took the point from a round table that it becomes actually quite awkward to try to raise so many signatures and verify them and do all these things. Uh, so I kind of came up with 10,000 as, as it was, frankly, I was writing it, I wrote 20 and then I changed it to 10 because I thought 20 was too much. So that's the one area, there's no guidance in the election committee process because there was no such uh, public recommendation procedure. So I think that's, there's some flexibility there, but I think the, the way to test it is to ask whether it allows a public voice and engages the public. That was one of my 10 questions, right? Whether it engages the public early in the process to participate, whether the public is being consulted early on in the nominating committee's deliberations. Uh, and so 10,000 seems to me uh, achievable, uh, a little harder than five, but not 70. Uh, so yeah, I think, that, that, and, and it, it, you're right, that this could be one of the movable parts where if somehow there's concern. I mean, why do we have civil nomination factor in there? Because the public don't trust the process. The public, the scholarism and others have come out. I know the Democratic camp, the, the 27 legislators, you know, in 2004, we're saying if we can just get a Democrat nominated, you know, we don't care how. So I know that this has evolved under public pressure because there's a public sentiment of distrust. Every time Beijing says block voting or or we're going to have to love China or love Hong Kong, the distrust of Hong just goes through the roof. And so having some notion of civic nomination is the response that, oh, we have to have direct public involvement because whatever nominating committee you guys are going to create isn't going to represent us. So if the nominating committee does well represent the public by its structure that I talked about, then probably people will be less worried about the civil nomination. Frankly, civil nominations have not been a big factor globally 
most countries in the world have some form of civil nomination. But it's rare that just a pure civil nomination as opposed to a party nomination have produced winning candidates. Usually these are the third also, we call them also grants. They are just somebody who managed to get enough signatures. Usually they're protest votes. They're getting their name on the ballot for protest purposes. So it's not ideal to have civil nominations be the centerpiece, the only way to have democratic process. Uh, so hopefully the nominating committee will be uh, developed in a way to achieve democracy in Hong Kong. And, and the civil recommendation component then will have to relate to that. You're right. Thank you very much, Professor Young. Thank you very much. That's I would like to hear your views on the comparison of your proposal with the Hong Kong 2020 proposal. The first part is about the, uh, the how, how essential is the public organization. The Hong Kong 2020, is that the 18 academics? No, 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 oh, the yeah. Anson Chan. Oh, Anson Chan, okay. Anson Chan yeah, I know that. Okay. In that also, um, um, it does not have the uh, public documentation right. part. And so I just, uh, especially for the demonstrants, that the, is it the essential part of the demonstrants that without the public recommendation, do you think that your proposal will not be able to satisfy the, the uh, guiding principles of international standards? And, and the second part difference is that uh, I think Simon's proposal is not explicit on this point, but uh, Michael's proposal mentioned that it would include all the uh, elected members of the PC. But in the essence of the Hong Kong White Party also, rather than having uh, EC members, they use a directly elected uh, NC members. So any significance of having EC members or having directly elected, that means that they will be, there will be a special election to be held for electing those uh, NC members. So just to hear that your the comparison between your two proposals with the Hong Kong Fund Fund proposal, especially on that two particular points. Well, since you talked about the witness test first, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think uh, you could, I think said that when I came up with my witness test proposal, it was mostly built around basic law and the ICCPR in the shadow of two constraints. One constraint is what we're hearing out of Beijing about not having civil nominations, about using, as the 2007 opinion uh, interpretation states, uh, using the at least election committee as a reference and so on. My other constraint was the public demand for civil nominations. So those two constraints were operating in the background. Otherwise, I would just have written a proposal for direct election of, of, the, of the committee. Uh, so within those constraints, I don't think the ICCPR either requires that we follow the nomination, the, the order basic law. Neither one of them requires that we follow the election committee model, model, and neither requires civil nomination. I don't think it is required by law to have civil nomination. What's required by law is that the that universal and equal voting, and that the voters be given a free and fair choice. So if that can be achieved by having a proper nominating committee, then fine. Unfortunately, you know, bargaining being what it is and Beijing's views being what they are, we will probably not get this fully representative nominating committee. And in the context of not complying with the ICCPR in regard to forming the nominating committee, one could make a much stronger argument then that some form of civil participation at least is more important. Though I don't think you can technically find any cases to say that it's required. Okay, so that, that would be my response on that. On Anson's proposal, uh, I, I, I think that's flexible. I think, I think you saw in my final slide, I said a directly elected one, then I gave two, two ways that you might get there. Uh, and one of them was to use the existing legislative members and elected district councilors. But I don't think you could have a direct election. And then just, you know, if we're not having some debate trying to stop Democrats from running, but we're rather now focused on practical and simple and easy to understand process, which I think is very important, then it might be better to use the election, the, the legislators and district councilors, 
because the voter does, voters sometimes do get election fatigue when they have so many things to choose, that, you know, so many steps where, where they have to do things. Uh, and so if the rest of the nominating committee is also being made up by sectoral elections, then having direct elections for the fourth sector, I think, piles on a bit. So prudence would suggest maybe using some existing direct elected officials in that position. But certainly nothing in the ICCPR or the basic law would require that. And so if we were leaving the elected committee model behind, or tossing it aside because it's only a recommendation in the 2007 opinion. So if we're no longer using this functional sectorial approach and we're directly electing the, the entire nominating committee, then of course I think uh, a direct election would be fine. Uh, probably better than using LegCo members because LegCo members weren't really elected for that purpose. They're elected for a whole bunch of other purposes. So then on that stage I would shift the goalpost a bit and say a, a direct election of the entire nominating committee would be good. But I don't know about shoving it into the fourth sector and then having all this other stuff going on at the same time. Uh, but Anson's doing it, recall, she doesn't actually change the other three sectors significantly. So she's doing it in the context of a very unequal uh, uh, election now nominating committee. Uh, and her proposal clearly would not pass the litmus test. But maybe, again, just like the Legislative Council as a nominating committee, it may be one of the deals we have to do uh, with our bottom line, I suppose, for people like yourself and many Democrats, being that there be real choice to the voters. That's the most comparative factor in all of this. Um, in our study of the uh, election committee, uh, one of our important findings was that Voter turnout rate for elections of the election committee terrible. They're the worst turnout rates for any form of election in Hong Kong. So the data is that, for example, in the election of, of the election committee members in 2000, the voter turnout rate was 19 percent. For 2006, 27 percent. I don't have the figure for 2011, but it probably roughly, I, I recall it was roughly fairly low. So any kind of proposal that can try to enhance public participation in the nomination process is a good thing. Right? And the reason why we had such low growth turnout rates, obviously, I mean, even lower than the functional constituencies in LegCo, is because people feel that it's meaningless. Right? And you don't want to perpetuate that. Uh, and so there's perhaps, you know, one you know, very important criticism of the existing uh, election committee. So with respect to the 2020 proposal, Having that public element uh, that they're having directly elected, I think will help reverse this, at least for those members. And that's very important, because that will get a lot more public involvement and interest. But I'm still unclear as to what they propose in terms of the nomination method. Right? And um, there are really four options. One is the existing paper nomination. Right? If they're proposing a paper nomination method. I feel that Beijing is going to rule that out when they give us their decision, probably in the summertime. I feel that that and also civic nominations will, will be, those will be the part of the parameters that they will set. Right? That they will say that it has to be a vote, that democratic procedures means it's a vote. So paper nominations will be out. The second option is to put a candidate before, a single candidate, before the nominating committee and say vote and then maybe that, see if that person passes the threshold. So it's kind of a qualification vote, right? I'm not sure what Beijing's position is on that, but I suspect that's probably not democratic to see. The third option is to put all the candidates, this is basically I think, uh, my track here, uh, Michael Davis's proposal, put all the candidates before the committee and take a vote and see who passes the 15% threshold. And the fourth option is my track A, put all the candidates before the take a vote and then have a cutoff, have a cutoff, like have a cap. I propose a cap of three candidates for track day. Right? So that, of course, Beijing would be happy with, because that has an effect of screening candidates. Um, but uh, we don't know what they think about in terms of proposal two and three. Um, and that may be where there's some room for negotiation. So I'm not sure where the 2020 proposal is on, 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 on those four proposals. 
Uh, and then lastly, I think also another important thing to keep in mind is that if you have directly elected, uh, if you have that this civic element that both Michael and I are proposing uh, in your method of elect nominations, that's going to change the entire dynamics of how a nomination by the nominating committee will work. Right? So for example, uh, if the nominating committee members, whether it's 1,200 or 1,600, they see that a particular candidate has so much public support, that will obviously affect their decision making. So that's something we've never seen before, and I think that's very important. And so if 2020, as uh, uh, in Chan's group, is excluding that, then I think they're missing out on something that's very important. I would just add that, bear in mind that Simon's proposal is not Beijing's block voting. He only has that on one track of his proposal. I, I, Simon can answer for himself, and I'm sure he wouldn't be supporting a proposal that would involve vetting out of candidates indirectly through just pure block, block voting without no civil participation. So civil participation, if that's what's happening, becomes vital uh, as a way to upgrade uh, and ensure the voters get free choice. I think that's the, the trick at the end of the day. And if Beijing insists on something that denies the voters free choice, uh, then we won't have a deal. That's what's really going to happen. I think you you would agree with that. You're the guy to comment on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think we have a question. Just push the button. Yeah. Uh, my name is Sean Leonard. I'm with the Asian Institute of International Financial Law at the Faculty of Law. Uh, I'm trying to separate Michael's incredible enthusiasm from reality, uh, particularly in view of the fact that Ernst Ewan, who's the head of the Justice Department, was quoted within the last couple of weeks as saying, the ICCPR has nothing to do with local law. Now, unless he's recanted that statement, the fact that he's one of the three executive members of the government here in charge of shepherding whatever will emerge from this process through, and submitting an election to Beijing and being the chief legal officer of the government to do so. How can you be so Can I am I confusing your enthusiasm with optimism? I wonder if you could expand on that. Yeah, you are confusing it with optimism. Uh, I think Beijing, right now, my impression is they still believe they're going to vet out candidates. <laughs> and their version of this game is to say the ICCPR doesn't apply due to a British reservation uh, and that the basic law forbids civil nomination, that, Democratic, that the nominating committee broadly representative only means that it represents the sectors they identify for the election committee uh, and so on. And, and that block voting is democratic procedure. If all of that happens, then I agree with Larry Diamond. They're not entirely free to define universal suffrage any way they want. So what they will have given Hong Kong will not be universal suffrage, uh, regardless of the statement that universal suffrage would be allowed in 2017. I'm quite pessimistic, actually, about their intentions. And as with our work a few years ago on Article 23, we went into that, I was a member of the Article 23 Concern Group, we went into that very pessimistic that we'd get anywhere, at best we'd make the law unpopular. Uh, we surprisingly won that. So it shows you that there is a possible politics in Hong Kong where alternative views uh, can be put forth consistently and passionately and in a way that makes it very difficult for Beijing to ignore them. And that's probably the only hope. Uh, but we'll have to see how serious they are about what probably is their goal when they say love Hong Kong and love China is to exclude people they consider not patriots. But I don't think that's the goal of academics or democratic politicians. They're going to have to put forth arguments, create models, ide identify ideas. When it comes to the ICCPR, uh, I think it would be very embarrassing for the government to hide behind the ICCPR. I know they tried to do it in various white papers in the past. Uh, they kind of claim, well, there's a reservation, so the ICCPR applies to Hong Kong except for that reservation. I would hope when they talk about universal suffrage at this point that they're no longer that thick-skinned 
to hide behind it, then you're right. There's reason for skepticism. I think it all comes down to a simple point. Is Beijing's instruction going to be no Democrats can get through, you guys figure out how to keep them out, or is it, or they may figure out how to keep them out, or is there some room for universal suffrage in Hong Kong? Uh, if it's the former, then I suppose we're going to have demonstrations on the street and so on, so it's going to turn into, so it's the question, do they want that? It, quite frankly, I think it's silly, because at the end of the day, sham election doesn't help them much. I think it causes, it causes them as much damage as it does Hong Kong. So I don't know that they want to have a full thought throttled embrace of a sham election. I would think most Hong Kong voters, and probably many Thai and others, would advocate that they simply boycott an election that was a sham election. So we'll see. I'm giving you ideas, Manny. I know the last time you had ideas, you got in trouble. <laughs> so, okay. On the ICCPR issue, um, there's two approaches uh, that government can take to ICCPR and the uh, reform. One, uh, which seems to be what uh, Mr. Yun seems to be taking, is to say that it's irrelevant to the election of the chief executive. Set it aside, it's not relevant at all. The second is to say, well, it's relevant, but of course, these are qualified rights and can impose reasonable restrictions. And so whatever we are doing here comes as a reasonable restriction. Um, that, I think, would probably be the wiser approach. I think it would be extremely foolish of them to take the first approach. And the reason being is that if there was ever any kind of core challenge uh, to any implemented reform, um, and the court was to ask, well, what did the you know, legislators or the executive, uh, what did they consider when they came to uh, looking at these proposals? And if it turns out that they didn't look at ICCPR at all, they had no thought to it at all because they thought it was irrelevant, then the court is not going to be very deferential. Um, and the court will not say, well, you know, government has considered, they, you know, they generally looked at these rights and gave weight to them, and then this is what they came up with. We will defer to that. But if they took the wrong decision by saying that ICCPR is irrelevant, and any kind of scrutiny of the uh, proposal you know, will be much more stricter from the court. Just a footnote to that is that there's a danger because the position has been taken by some people in the establishment camp that this would not even be for the courts, that it would have to be referred to the standing committee of the NPC for interpretation. So there's a danger that Beijing will take the most uh, you know, uh, conservative position on all of this. Again, like I said, I just don't think that's that's not what Hong Kong people are going to do, at least in this political debate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jason Liu, my second year PhD uh, law student here in the Faculty of Law. Um, both of your proposals are incredibly detailed, but Professor Davis, there's one issue within your proposal that I thought was slightly uh, less detailed than the others, and that was the requirement of the good faith consideration under the public nomination uh, vote gives. Um, to me, I, I know you said an up and down vote, which I think is a very, very good beginning standard. I wonder if you care to elaborate any more what else would be considered uh, good faith, uh, a debate, a hearing, an open interview process, for example, because I fear that if you don't state what that is ahead of time, you're going to have a Hong Kong TV kind of situation, and you're going to invite litigation later, and nobody wants this going to the Court of Final Appeals. I think uh, the word notion of good faith in various areas of the law is, is available. If you're right, I mean, let's face it, what will happen is, is there's this admonition to members of the nominating committee to consider people with popular support, and there's good arguments for doing that. They're not compelled. Frankly, uh, some ones from the SCMP will know that my earlier proposal was that uh, people had the signatures that it would be binding on the nominating committee. But then I reformed my proposal to get around Beijing's objection to the civil nomination idea. Uh, and I'm not happy with that. I would like the idea, I would be happy to elevate the numbers to the 70,000 if it was binding on the nominating committee. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, it seems like 
I think Simon's right, Beijing's not going to embrace civil nominations. So uh, I think that's all we can enhance. Uh, I think, I, I doubt someone could get away with suing that they weren't considered. I, I think good faith doesn't mean you have to comply. It never does. It just means that you have to consider. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I doubt. I, I suppose someone could try to test that on a court, but I don't think they'd get too far. Any more questions? Any more questions for the floor? Just a quick question for the Professor Young has uh, the Reform Committee, and Professor Davis has the Working Group. Um, and it's similar in nature, and both of them would require someone who's in a position which has a lot of uh, stature in society. How would the members of the working group and the committee be selected? It's, it's a great question, and, um, and I didn't go that far in terms of detail. But I think once political parties uh, catch on to this idea, and I think it's, it's a good one, then obviously because the two-thirds uh, will um, uh, you know, come, has to come from legislators, then perhaps legislators should have a role and have a say in terms of composition. It shouldn't just be done by the chief executive. Um, so uh, this will then be quite an interesting uh, area for discussion. I, mean, I don't have a particular uh, proposal yet, but I think uh, there may be some kind of mechanism where uh, those who are part of the, uh, the amendment formula uh, should have some role in, in uh, suggesting candidates uh, for this committee. Thank you, sir. I, I likewise, I haven't thought through in great detail. I tend to think of my working group more as expert uh, rather than representative. <clears throat> so the judge is a nice expert. There's a reason for someone either in the judiciary or retired uh, just because the ethics of judicial decision making uh, emphasizes objectivity and so on. And I kind of like the idea because I, I have, yeah, I, I'm concerned that everyone have equal voting rights. That I would want experts who are good at calculating and predicting how many voters there would be in the sector. So people like Robert Chung and so on. There's a big debate internationally about representative versus expert uh, bodies. And I think this would be a better case for an expert body. Uh, expert bodies can then take testimony from people who are involved in politics uh, to, uh, you know, have open hearings and to consider uh, concerns regarding such uh, definition of these sectors and subsectors. I think that approach is better than having a, a representative body which could get entangled and unable to decide anything. Uh, I think expert body would be better. And, and, and again, I think Hong Kong is loaded with experts uh, on, on the math side of it, on the political side of it, and on the legal side of it. So I think uh, uh, it wouldn't be that difficult. Hong Kong is one of the cities I know that has so many commissions and boards. I'm sure they can come up with another one. <laughs> yeah, I think that would be a whole question. So my name is Terrence Yao. Uh, uh, my, uh, you know, all these proposals are pretty uh, technical in nature, you know, uh, very confusing to me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because I'm not a good numbers guy. Anyway, uh, if I may ask a more rhetorical question, Professor, you, you refer a couple of times to a sham election. Uh, maybe this is not your, not your view, but anyway, this is a term you use. But from Beijing's point of view, I think they, they apparently want to when we use the word manage election or control election. So I'm just wondering, from a rhetorical point of view, where does, or conceptual point of view, where, where does one begin and where does the other end? Because at this time, I can say that both camps are quite uh, uncompromising, you know, and we are not sure of all the baseline and all that. So what would be a likely and acceptable uh, uh, compromise, uh, you know, in your view? I, I know this is kind of putting you on the line, but I'm just That's what I'm here for, to be on the line. Uh, thank you for your question. 
Well, this is why I give this litmus test proposal, and I give it as one constructed within the shadow of, of the viewpoints offered both by the public and the Democratic camp about civil nominations and public participation and the viewpoints of Beijing uh, regarding not using civil nominations, uh, using the election committee as a reference and all of that. So I try to do that and to give a litmus test the litmus test and 10 questions that I put at the end of it very clearly emphasize that the voters be given free choice. Uh, and free choice it would mean that obviously some uh, candidates, that the nomination process could produce candidates from the competing camps of substance in Hong Kong. Uh, if that's denied, if a quote unquote managed election is uh, I remember, I think it was Sir Percy Craddock or someone years ago said that Beijing doesn't mind holding elections as long as it knows the outcome ahead of time. If that's the basis on which the election is conducted, then I doubt there will be compromise. That, that Hong Kong, uh, you know, as Martin Lee and Edson Chan's discussions with the U.S. Vice President over the past weekend suggest, that there's a, a, a lot of distrust and that Hong Kong worries about maintaining its autonomy. The people of Hong Kong are concerned about it. And I think there's a substantial political voice in Hong Kong that would not find a quote-unquote managed election, that is where you know the outcome ahead of time, acceptable. So it, it, in some ways it comes down to is, is that what Beijing is going to insist on? And if they do, then I suppose we'll be staying with what we got right now. That we'll probably have no movement at all. The compromise position will be uh, no new uh, electoral process. It uh, seems to me that's that's the outcome. Now, is that good for anyone? Probably not. But I, I can't imagine. Uh, in fact, I feel sorry for any Democrat who says, "Okay, I'm okay with a managed election and knowing the outcome ahead of time, and no Democrats." I just can't see that happening. It, it's not realistic. It, it violates their own self-interest in a way that's pretty profound and, and complete. So it seems to me that somehow, and this is where I think the government's important. Uh, sometimes our government, and that's why we need more democracy in Hong Kong, uh, tends not to convey to effectively Hong Kong people's views, in my, in my view, to Beijing, so that Beijing can understand them better. I don't think Hong Kong people are out to have a revolution and overthrow China. I've never, I've been here since 1985, and I've, I've been yet to see a revolution uh, in Hong Kong. So I don't think Hong Kong poses the threat to Beijing that Beijing imagines, and that Beijing itself is a growing, changing society that has to come to grips with a lot of these same issues in the, in the decades to come. So in, in a way, Hong Kong is a benefit to Beijing, and I think our government sometimes fails to convey that. It seems to only convey Beijing's view back to us, uh, you know, as, as a dividing line or something. But it doesn't seem to be conveying it the other way. And this is the one way that I think public, uh, you know, demonstrations and public uh, resistance has proven important. That some, eventually a, a different view gets through to Beijing. And I think that's the only way a compromise is going to be achievable. If, if the election outcome is known ahead of time, how can anyone embrace that? Yeah. I think we have to think about what, what do we mean by Beijing managing the election? What does that mean? Um, I don't think it means, uh, uh, you know, the uh, example that Michael used before, uh, Beijing knowing the results in advance. I don't think they're that ambitious or um, uh, crazy, really. Um, I think uh, uh, then, uh, then does it mean that maybe they uh, would like to know uh, that have a guarantee that the range of candidates are going to be accepted? Again, I think they're starting to realize that that's going to be impossible to, to guarantee. No one can really have a system to guarantee that uh, if it's going to be at least open and transparent and be democratic. And maybe I think what it means really is that they want a system whereby they don't get confrontational candidates. They don't get conf confrontational candidates. Who might be confrontational candidates? Well, So-called well, radicals. Um, so if that's what they mean, you know, I think maybe we're heading towards some kind of common ground. Because as this process is 
moving ahead, right, we're starting to see that there are three kinds of proposals that are being presented. The first kind is those that contain elements which Beijing finds unacceptable. Right? So the so-called civic nomination, because a civic nomination is a route where, whereby you could get a confrontation candidate. Right? And that is clearly being ruled out, and it seems like slowly but surely can Hong Kong people are coming to accept that. Um, and then there's the other extreme, where uh, there are those uh, models that have qualities that reflect the status quo, which uh, you know, Michael says is completely unacceptable. Right? And that, I think, uh, people accept. That I think there's this consensus that the, 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 the nominating committee has to be much more representative. So we're left in this, sort of this middle category, where there is a range of possible, possible models. And, 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 you know, I think that's where the focus of attention is going to be. So we're going to, we're going to watch this trip uh, that's going to take place at the end of this week to Shanghai very closely to see if there's anything said, especially from the Chinese side, that indicates what they find acceptable within those models that are in that middle category. Um, and, uh, yeah. I would say I agree with Simon on this. That's why he and I have these proposals largely using. And this was a big move because up until, I guess my proposal was the first of these, of this new type. Uh, until then, then there was just civil nominations in most of the Democratic camp proposals and almost no proposals from the establishment camp. So what we're seeing now, and, and even uh, Carrie Lab has acknowledged, we're seeing these proposals that look like uh, they, they passed the basic law litmus test uh, although we insist they pass the ICCPR test as well. And I don't think that's difficult. I think it's achievable. Uh, but uh, it does mean that Beijing will not be able to know the outcome ahead of time. And that's the, un that's the unknown. We just don't know whether Beijing is, is flexible or not. Their statements often make us skeptical whether they are. But we have to see. Thank you very much, Professor David and Professor Young. This concludes today's session. Please join us in thanking once again Professor Davis and Professor Young for these very clear um, and insightful presentations and discussion too. We all learned a lot from this session. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, so uh, we have a couple of Cantonese sessions to come. Simultaneous interpretation will be provided upon request, and these will take place on the 8th, 16th, 22nd, and 29th of this month. We may have an additional session on the 24th. Hope to see you again. Thank you, Mark. I would say, can you tell you most of my favorite questions? Just give me your card and I'll email you.